Welcome to the Law Spot Podcast with your host, Melissa Gray. Join her as she highlights legal professionals and trending legal issues facing entrepreneurs and small business owners. Ready to dive into life and law? You're in the right spot. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Law Spot. I'm excited for today's guest, Michael Mayer. He is an equity partner at Nordeman and an expert in trademark law with the European Union um, practices out of Germany. Everyone, please welcome Michael. Thank you so much, Melissa, for having me. It's a it's an honor and a pure pleasure. So Michael and I had the opportunity to meet in person at one of our INTA conferences, and we've worked together uh, for, for multiple clients. But Michael, why don't you tell the listeners just a little bit about your practice at Nordeman and then maybe like the firm in general for um, what you what your service areas are? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. So basically, I'm, I'm a real trademark nerd. I love trademarks. I've been in trademarks since almost 20 years and it's really my specialty and that's what I'm passionate about and what I really love. Um, the firm uh, Norman is a boutique firm, one of the well-known reputated firms in Germany specializing on IP and all aspects of IP, uh, including trademarks, copyright, unfair competition, antitrust, uh, designs anything you can think of in the field of IP uh, with a great team and it's 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 really fun fun team it's not only you know a law firm but it's it's sort of a family it's a it's a good vibe here awesome you're also a professor of trademark law at Dusseldorf University and have guest lectured at Harvard and San Francisco law so you are well versed in in your field and today I want to touch on uh, obviously my my listeners are primarily us based so if they're considering entering into the european market what should they know about the differences between a us trademark protection and eu trademark protection first of all let's just clarify that filing a trademark does not protect you worldwide. It is country specific. So in the US, that is a common misconception. But so let's assume they they understand that. And if they're going abroad into the EU, what are the differences both on the, the prosecution side, but also the protections that you might get from a registration? Absolutely, Melissa. So, I mean, there are a few interesting differences. Some of them are actually more in, in favor, I would say, for, for U.S. practitioners, because let's say, for instance, um, when it comes to the specification of goods and services, when you prepare the list of goods and services, in the U.S., you have to be very specific. You, have, you know, you cannot just apply for a general term, let's say, I apply um, Gucci for clothing, that wouldn't work, but you would have to specify it, clothing, namely, whatever it is, t-shirts, uh, underwear, et cetera, et cetera. You have to be very, very specific. Otherwise, the trademark would be subject to an, an office action by the USPTO. Unlike in the EU, where you can actually claim very broad and general terms, which means they will give you very broad protection. Um, and that, that's very interesting. Um, and, 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 you know, I always compare trademark law with a chess game. It's, it's a very strategic field of law. Yes. And um, you have to think very strategically. Um, and it could, in some cases, make sense to file very broadly because then you can claim a monopoly on, on, on those terms. Which leads me to the next point, which is the intent of use. When you file a mark in the US, you have to demonstrate to the examiner that you're either already using the mark or you have an intent of to use it, which is not the case in the EU, which is maybe from US perspective quite odd. But in fact, you can file a trademark in the EU without having at least uh, you don't have to prove it, any intention to use the mark, which would allow you 
and then I, which I come back to the point I just mentioned before, you could claim, you could file a trademark for defensive purposes by claiming a very broad specification of goods and services. And, um, which leads me to the next point, which is the period of non-use. So in, in the EU, you don't have to use your mark for a period of five years. And the background to that is that the legislator basically uh, wants to provide the trademark owner with enough time to get going, to develop its uh, product, to bring it on the market, et cetera, et cetera, which indeed will take some time. And therefore, you have a period of five years where you don't have to have any use of the mark, but nevertheless, you are entitled to enforce your mark, which for also from a U.S. perspective might be very a very strange thought. Um, and then the last thing, um, and that, that that's a very um, general point, is U.S. Is a, has a common law system, which is not the case in the EU, at least not in every member state of the EU. There might be some exceptions like Ireland, formerly UK, obviously, and I think also Malta. But in most of the cases, you don't have the common law system, which means that pure use will not provide you with any protection. And many times clients will come and say, but we use the mark. They cannot challenge us. We have started use before before them. But in, in the EU, the only thing that really counts is the pure um, priority date in the register and not the use of, of your mark. That seems very harsh compared to the U.S. <laughs> system. Um, but uh, obviously, that's one of the main points and why registration is so important if you're considering entering into the EU. So maybe you describe the filing options for listeners. The EU obviously is a is a 27 countries that have band together to to allow a single filing. But when is that appropriate versus maybe say going to that individual country and filing there um, you know on a one-off basis as opposed to um, encompassing all of them at the EU TM. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, basically, you have three different options in order to obtain trademark protection in the EU. It's either through the Madrid system. For example, you have already a U.S. basic registration, and then you decide to extend that trademark through the Madrid system to the EU, either by claiming an EU trademark or indeed by claiming national trademarks. And the reason for doing one or the other heavily depends, in fact, on your trademark clearance. Um, so first of all, I mean, obviously, uh, Melissa, before filing any trademark, it's, it's uh, uh, recommendable to proceed with a, a trademark clearance search, at least to do a, a superficial knockout search, just to, you know, to be more or less on the safe side that there are no obstacles out there. And it, it could be that for, you know, that there might be an earlier trademark, conflicting trademark in Spain. And if you file an EU trademark, and I think that's important for the listeners to know, any earlier trademark of the member states could be opposed to the EU trademark. So that means there are a lot of relative grounds which can be used against the filing of an EU application. So there could be an earlier German trademark, an earlier Spanish trademark, earlier Italian trademark, and so on. So from that perspective, it could make sense to rather fill the gaps where are no earlier rights by filing nationally instead of uh, filing an EUTM. On the other hand, and, and, and well, let me continue that aspect. The other problem with the EU trademark is that when the examiner or the office checks the trademark application for absolute grounds, obviously all the languages of the EU will be considered. 
and and there might be a lot of reasons why an EU application will be refused based on absolute grounds, whereas on a national basis, there might be less grounds. And then the last point, also um, interesting, is when it comes to use. When you have to provide proof of use of an EU TM, you have to show that the EU the mark was used well, at least in a significant portion of the EU, which can be sometimes difficult. Whereas if you just use it in one member state, it will be much easier to, to demonstrate use. On the other hand, the, obviously the big advantage of an EU TM is costs. I mean, you know, by it's, 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 it's a very low cost involved. They're only 850 euros uh, to cover one class and to cover uh, all the member states of the EU, which is amazing. If you would add up filing in 27 member states, <laughs> you will be easily <laughs> by, I mean, I don't know, probably 20 to 30,000 euros. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So it's a very cost-effective and straightforward way of obtaining protection in the EU. So I would think there are a lot of pro and cons. Usually what I tell my clients is if you just simply want to do your business and you don't necessarily want to litigate or enforce your trademark, an EU trademark is absolutely fine. It's, it's perfect. When it comes to enforcement, it might be better to relay on national rights for sad reason. It's, it's, it's harder to challenge a national trademark for non-use. It might be harder to find earlier rights to challenge the, the mark on, on relative grounds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but just for a company to do their business, I think a EU trademark makes absolute sense. So is one strategy perhaps to to file one EUTM application and then in a in a member state where they're very active, maybe do a national filing there just to shore up that protection? Yes. yes. So and, and, and even to be more specific, um, it could make sense that you file an EUTM for very broad specifications and file a national trademark for very specific uh, specifications, which exactly cover your activity. So there will be, in case of a challenge or a conflict, no real issue when it comes to the use question, etc., because mm -hmm. you're not using those broad terms. Um, so for litigation reasons, uh, that can really make sense. So how is the office, uh, the EUTM, been over the last few years? I know that in the U.S. specifically, we've seen an uptick in the number of filings. And also due to that influx, I feel like the examiners are being um, much more strict and scrutinizing the applications a lot more in the sense that what would have not been challenged five years ago is facing challenge today, not only with the descriptiveness issue, but also um, what we refer to as a 2D, which would be the likelihood of confusion with other trademarks that might already be registered. So what are you seeing um, as a trend in the EU or even you know, member states specifically on that front? Have you noticed the same thing or is it you know, business as usual as far as prosecution. It, it, it's, it's very interesting, Melissa. Over the last 20 years, I would say there have been different waves. Uh, remember when before the EU trademark system was put in place, I think it was in 90, 1997 or 1998, we only had national trademarks. Then the EU system was established. And at the time, the EU IPO was obviously much more tolerant in order to move <laughs> the trademark applicants away from the national systems, but to move them to the EU system. So they had a tendency of accepting more trademarks, even though they may not really meet the standard of, you know, being distinctive or non-descriptive. 
um, whereas the, the national offices were more strict. Uh, then the EU trademark became a huge success and the EU IPO <laughs> became more and more strict, whereas the national offices noticed that there was a downfall in applications, so they became more tolerant and had a tendency of accepting more and more uh, trademarks. Nowadays, I would say there's no real difference between the national and the EU offices. They are bo both very strict. And I think since every examiner is using the internet and, and is checking you know, the trademarks for any potential meaning in any potential <laughs> language, um, there has been an increase in, in objections. And, and just um, one more point, because you just mentioned that, um, unlike in the US where the USPTO is checking for earlier trademarks, this is not the case in the EU, neither before the EIPO nor before uh, national trademark offices. They're only checking for absolute grounds, but not for already existing trademarks, which is also an interesting um, difference. It is. Okay, so what else should U.S. business owners know about the latest developments from maybe the general court? I know you said there was a recent decision. I want to touch on that because I think it's really important um, in terms of what your potential is and who should be thinking about registering in the EU, even if you're not in use directly yes. in the EU. There has been a very interesting case. In, in fact, I, ha I have been involved in that case to a certain extent of the general record uh, of last July, so July 2022. And it concerned an hotel based in the US who owned or who owns an EU trademark and advertised its hotel services in the EU. However, there was no hotel in the EU. So the services of the hotel were exclusively offered and rendered in the US. And the EU mark was challenged for non-use and the question that arose was whether it is possible to use an EU trademark if the services are offered outside of the EU. And interestingly, the EIPO at the first and on the appeal level denied that and were of the opinion that there couldn't be any genuine use of the mark because the services were not rendered in the EU. Um, However, we always thought that would be absolute nonsense. And we were very happy to learn that the general court confirmed our opinion. And the reasoning is very simple. The definition provided by the Court of Justice of the European Union to define whether or not there is genuine use is the question whether the trademark owner wants to maintain or obtain market shares in the EU. And if when you apply that definition, obviously the US owner wanted to obtain and, and maintain market shares in the EU because this is where the potential customers for their hotel services are based. And they were in fact advertising their hotels in the EU and we could demonstrate that there were, you know, advertisement, et cetera, made in the EU. And therefore, the general courts said, yeah, even though the hotel is based in the US, there can be use of an EU trademark. And it's a very interesting decision. And it's one of the last pieces of a huge puzzle or picture that was missing when it came to the questions, uh, question of genuine use. Well, and in the digital world, knowing that, I mean, and that has broader applications uh, than just the hotel industry, uh, in, entertainers, uh, people that sell products even where maybe they, they can ship into that country, but they don't have use in that country. Um, 
that that has a really broad uh, application. So, Absolutely. so that's a that's a good one to note um, for for people that are not necessarily in use, but you're you want a market share of that country. So, exactly. is there are there any other um, cases that are that are pending in that sphere that might give more clarity or is that is that the last one no i i think the general court took a very clear position um i think it's now only a question of the evidence that you're able to provide and then you know the the office or the examiner in charge will have to determine whether the amount of evidence that you are you know, submitting to the office is sufficient to demonstrate that you were advertising um, your hotel or other services which outside of the EU, in the EU. Um, and, and I think that might be something trademark owners have to think about how they can actually secure evidence in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, because it's might be not that easy i mean you have to you can provide invoices you can show we have invested so much money in advertising which is a good thing you can maybe secure um you know analytics of of websites uh how many visitors from the eu were visiting your website maybe also how many customers of coming from the EU stayed in your hotel, you know. Um, but I think you have to think about how you can secure such evidence so that in case of a challenge, you're able to provide such evidence in, uh, to the office. And in that particular case, they had, a, they had a registration, but let's say hypothetically, this hotel did not, but somebody in the EU filed for and obtained a registration. I mean, that is the risk if you are targeting customers in that area exactly. where you are it's, not able to. You exactly. Know, and that, that is one of the arguments why I always thought, of course, that must be used because otherwise someone wouldn't, you know, let's say Hilton, you know, let's say, let's assume there wouldn't be any Hilton hotel in the EU and someone would, you know, come in the EU and register Hilton for hotel services. They would be completely blocked. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. Well, uh, makes sense to me, uh, but but it's nice to have the the support of the general court now and <laughs> something to rely on. So I'm sure that was a fun one for you to work on. Um, so what's next for you? Uh, um, you're going to Inta in Singapore coming up. Um, yeah. So that'll I'm trying to find a good umbrella which I fits in 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 the in the plane in my hand luggage. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need it. You'll need it. Um, well, where can people where can people find you and your firm if they mm -hmm. want to? Um, obviously, we work together, so so my clients already know you. But um, in terms of uh, people that might have questions about the EU specifically or. Um, want to reach out and and discuss it more or follow your your teachings. Th thank you, Melissa. So our website is uh, nordeman.de, so n o r d e m a n n dot de. -E. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think my name will be mentioned uh, on on the description. Michael C. Mayer on LinkedIn. I must say, uh, Mayer is a very common name, unfortunately, in Germany, as well as Michael. <laughs> so um, make sure that you look for Michael C. Mayer. Thank you so much for your uh, expertise and knowledge. I know this will be helpful to a lot of business owners here stateside. Melissa, thank you so much for having me. It was really an honor to be part of, of your podcast. It's oh, a, it's thank a you fabulous for podcast. Thank you so much. And I will leave everything in the show notes for the listeners. And until next time, bye, everyone. Bye.